Hey guys, good evening. Um, just checking over the attendance here, making sure folks have first and last names. Yeah, good evening, Brandy. So a smaller group tonight. Um, yeah, hey, Cassandra, how are you? Um, so we got a smaller group. But sometimes these go quick. Sometimes these uh, can go the whole hour. So we'll just see. Uh, hiya. Perhaps Hyatt, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Good evening. Uh, sometimes I butcher people's names. I apologize. Um, so, what are we up to this week? Uh, last week, I know we had fall um, fall break for two weeks, and uh, now we're back. And I just kind of want to get a feel for what chapters we're starting uh this week i know my students are taking exam two muscle tissue okay well that's a good one um i want to see if we can i'm going to look up something while you guys are typing and i want to see if i can find it So we are doing muscle physiology this week. Okay. Great. All right. Alexa says about to take test three. So that's good. Um, do we have any questions about test three? What is test three for you, Alexa? I think my students are taking tests too, and then we're about to ramp it up next week. Um, and then the back half of the semester is going to fly by. So chapter 11, Stephanie says. Okay, so the big thing that we're probably going to go over tonight, and this will probably be fairly quick, um, and I'm going to take a, I want to take a step, sit back for a minute. Um, Okay, so cardiac tissue, uh, smooth muscle tissue, and skeletal muscle, right? Um, that's pretty much kind of what, we, what we're going for here. Um, so the big thing with muscle physiology is really a cornerstone of, of physiology itself is the, is the sliding filament theory. Okay, the sliding filament theory, as we know, is really – what allows the muscles to uh, contract, right? Um, to contract in a way that produces force. How your little fingers can hold you up on a side of a building, okay? Now think about that. You've seen these, these, these um, movies or maybe you've experienced yourself where you're hanging from a ledge by your fingers, right? When well, you may be 120, 150, 200 pounds, maybe even more, and yet your fingers are able to withstand the amount of weight of your body by grabbing onto something just by, you know, 10 digits or less. Um, and that's what's kind of fascinating with muscle physiology is how does it do that, right? And what it really boils down to is the sarcomeres. And um, sarcomeres basically, um, as we know, are the motor units. Excuse me. Ooh, too early for that. In the week, at least. I am exhausted. Um, so it's really the motor units of the muscle itself, right? That's what sarcomeres are. Now, within these sarcomeres, think of it as like a long cylinder tube right you've probably seen it in your notes and within these 
these sarcomeres are these two types of um, structures, right? Skeletal, cyt uh, skeletal structures, cytoskeleton, as, we, as we'll call them. And one of them is called myosin, and the other one is called actin, right? And it just so happens that they slide next to each other, and this is what it grips onto to produce tension, okay? When we have, when we do a bicep curl, you may notice that your muscle actually gets larger. You know, you see people flexing and you see how big their muscle uh, stands out uh, above their humerus. Well, basically what that is, is that all that is, is the soccer mirrors are contracting so to be become so much shorter that the muscle tissue really has nowhere to go but up, right? And that just, you know, and, and cultural days or pop culture or whatever you want to call it if you want to show show off how many muscles you have you you know you flex that's what that's you know flex thinking about it and that's pretty much allowing uh tension in the muscles to uh to shorten your sarcomeres and that kind of demonstrates how much um muscle tissue we have you know which is kind of interesting so let's go a little bit deeper and feel free to stop me on this at any moment. Um, does anybody know the big player in muscle physiology? Like what electrolyte plays a huge role in muscle uh, contraction? And does anybody know what electrolytes are? Okay. I guess my Alexa just turned on that light. What are electrolytes? Question marks. Don't know. Sodium. Okay. That is an electrolyte, so we're good. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, make sure I turn my speakers on. Potassium. Yeah. Yeah, that's an electrolyte. It's not the big one. Uh, minerals in your blood, yes, but I want to dive down deeper than that. Um, so you've named two big ones, not exactly the most important. Uh, lactic acid is what happens when, and we can go into that uh, later, Madison, how we produce lactic acid. That's actually something that the body wants to get rid of. Um, so not exactly, but I will touch on, yes, bingo, calcium. Okay. Now. Um, calcium is the answer. Calcium two plus. Uh, it's a cation, otherwise known as an electrolyte. And what happens is, is like when we have, I'm just going to take you guys from the top, okay? So when we are walking, or we're talking, or we're moving our hands, whatever it may be, the brain sends sends a signal an action potential down to where, what muscle we want to move, right? And what happens is, is that it's really just an action potential, right? It's an action potential that gets propagated through the neurons, and then eventually that neuron will, will um, end at a muscle tissue, right? Um, this is the neuromuscular junction neuro nervous nervous system muscular the muscle system the neuromuscular junction where eventually it will innervate a muscle this is called the end plate right and what happens is is that um you you have the terminal baton or something like that maybe acetylcholine gets released um well typically that's what we're, we'll, we'll just keep it at skeletal muscle so we release acetylcholine from the uh, from the neuron side, and then uh, it goes across the synaptic cleft to bind to the muscle side. And keep in mind, calcium has to be calcium has to be voltage gated calcium channels because it's voltage. So that's the action potential part. Voltage gated calcium channels have to open because the action potential has arrived at the at the end plate, calcium rushes into the cell, and that calcium actually will release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, right? Into the synapse. Excuse me. 
Goodness. I knew I didn't sleep very well last night. So what happens is, is that the acetylcholine will go into the muscle and it'll bind. And then what happens is, is that we have this contraption called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, we probably remember that from our notes because that's kind of a big deal. And if we're kind of, if you, now you're probably knocking off the rust and figuring out, oh, it is calcium because if you remember what the sarcoplasmic reticulum does is that it houses calcium. It's like a big bag of calcium, right? So all of a sudden, this synap this sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, gets, re gets opened up and out comes calcium into the muscles. Okay, everywhere. So you probably remember the term T-tubule. Well, T-tubule is um, is a uh, think of it as like a highway system for calcium to go and find um, you know areas to bind. Okay, so we'll just keep it at that, and we'll kind of come back for that in a minute because now I'm going to explain to you the other side of what calcium goes and binds. And we kind of already talked about it. it was, it's the actin and myosin part, right? So we have myosin heads, right? Myosin filaments that we probably learned back in chapter three or chapter two, um, so cellular organelles. And we have actin, and they kind of slide back and forth, right? Well, you may know that a muscle has to flex and a muscle has to relax, okay? A muscle has to flex and then a muscle has to relax. So when we are talking about flexing, we have to have this binding of myosin heads and actin filaments together. Okay. That's that's the that's the big that's the big part that causes this contraction. But it has to be controlled, right? We can't just have you know, uncontrolled flexing and relaxing, that didn't make sense. And all this is governed by the release of calcium. All right. So calcium has to bind somewhere in order for all this to get going. And so it just so happens that these, these myosin heads um, bind or look for areas of actin. Okay. They look for areas of, of, of actin. Uh, actin binding filaments. So there's binding sites along actin. And what happens is it, that it's kind of covered by this protein called tropomyosin. Think of it as like a gate, right? It's kind of like thinking of like a, I always thought of it as like a Twizzler. That's kind of how they explain it in the book. You know, how you have these like these these Twizzlers that we eat that um, you know they have basically these little it's like a rope structure. It's kind of looped around. I think of that as tropomyosin wrapping around actin, and it's kind of hiding these bonding sites that myosin is looking for so it can create tension. Well, when calcium comes and calcium binds to tropomyosin, it causes it to kind of adjust over, and it, it unveils these binding sites that myosin is looking for so we can flex our muscles. And does anybody know what actually uh, myosin heads bind to along that actin filament? Do we know what we test for when we have a heart attack? What's the lab test that we test for to screen somebody for a heart attack? We can take an EKG. Close, close, Emily, yes. Uh, but yeah, the, so the answer, to let the actual lab test when we're drawing blood is, is what Cassandra said. It's a troponin. So troponin just so happens to be the site that myosin heads bind for uh, along the actin filament, okay? So this makes a lot of sense because if we have a heart attack, that means we have some blockage going on somewhere, which means oxygen is not getting to these tissues. These tissues die off and then all this. Yeah, there you go. Of course, you probably draw those all day. 
Um, I test though. So I'm, I'm on the, so my daytime uh, career is um, being in the lab. So you and I could probably work hand in hand together. Um, so when these troponins, um, when Cassandra goes and draws blood and brings it to, let's say me in the back, and then I put it on an analyzer to test if there's been any troponin in the blood, what we're really move my camera down what we're really testing for is troponin a broken off tissue or dead dead cardiac tissue or, or or damaged actin filaments because there's been a blockage there's been a lack of oxygen this this tissue has become damaged or necrosed and now it's floating around in the circulation right and so when when Cassandra goes and draws your blood to see if you've had an elevated troponin what it's really testing for is some kind of cardiac damage, right? It's the most uh, sensitive, specific test we have to a heart attack because troponin is nowhere else. Troponin is in the cardiac tissue, okay? Um, so that is the most interesting part, in my opinion, of, of how the sliding filament theory can be applied to something, you know, very important. Um, so back to our story. So we have this troponin that's the binding site for the myosin head that is found on the actin filament, okay? So when calcium comes, because calcium is the, the main player here, goes in, travels through the T-tubules, starts binding to these tropomyosin uh, proteins that are blocking the troponin. You have to remember trop tropomyosin and then troponin. Don't get hung up on, an ex on exam questions about that. Then the calcium binds to the tropomyosin, causes it to rotate. It unveils the, the actin binding sites, troponin, and that's where myosin heads will kind of link into. And then a couple, you know, thousands or hundreds or how many of those is, you, all of a sudden you, this myosin head links into this actin filament and then you start getting this tension, okay? And that's how you use your muscles, right? Now, if you need to lift up a car, then you will you will recruit more motor units in your muscle, more sarcomeres, right? Um, that are really there to, and as as you may recall, we're kind of zooming out because now we're looking at the sarcomere. When we're really zooming in is when we're looking at uh, tropomyosin, troponin, calcium, and binding. Now we're zooming out to look at the bigger picture, and that has to do with the sarcomeres or the motor units of, let's say, uh, fingers or your your quad, right, quadricep um, or hamstring, one of the largest muscles in your body. So that that is um, very important. So now, when we want to relax the muscle, what has to happen? I'll have you guys chat me something. Does anybody know? Crickets. Okay. So that's all right. Well, thank you for participating. At least you told me. Um, we have to get rid of calcium, right? Calcium is what causes things to roll over. So now we have to pump the calcium out. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum acts like the sodium potassium pump. Okay, it acts like the sodium potassium pump and it will pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's what happens. So now we're, the body has no more calcium. Troponin, tropomyosin covers over the bonding sites and now we have a relaxing muscle. Okay. We won't get into how the myosin head binds to actin, 
that's using ATP and stuff like that. We'll change, we'll use that for another night. Um, hold on here. As Cassandra says, so is there a way that it reduces the damage cell so troponin levels reduce? Uh, yeah, eventually the, I mean, if you can correct, if you can correct the MI or the myocardial infarction or, you know, heart attack, then you can restore, uh, blood, you know, oxygenated, oxygenated blood to the tissue. Eventually the, the heart will go, will undergo a remodeling stage is what they call it. A, a, a healing stage where it, um, you know, fibroblasts come in and kind of creates the the fibroblasts will um, kind of fill in the holes from the cardiac tissue. They don't do anything. They're just like you know they're 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 collagen essentially, and uh, too much of that you'll pretty much have a failing heart. So it's not the that's not the you know it's not a good thing. So. Same way it reduces damage cells. I think uh, you know your your kidneys will will filter out the troponin levels eventually. Um, so then you'll you'll know. Um, let's go through. Let's go through how the myosin head binds actin because I want to ask you all this question. So the interesting thing, and this kind of goes back to what Madison was talking about with lactic acid. When 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 an, when a when the muscle uses energy, or when a muscle needs to flex, it uses energy, right? I mean, we have to have energy to flex our to flex muscles, ATP. And in order for us to make ATP, we have to have oxygen. We do need glucose. Glucose will make, yes. We have to, or if we don't have glucose, we can have fats too. You know, let's not forget the keto diet or, you know, what happens when people don't eat. They can, you know, get their glucose or energy from protein. They get their energy from fats, but yes, typically they can get their um, they can get their energy from um, from glucose. So when eventually we make ATP and we have the electron transport chain that bounces down, and then it, and eventually that electron will touch uh, oxygen, right, to make water. That's, if you remember anything about metabolism, we have all this that kind of happens. And then um, as the electron meets the final stage, it binds to oxygen and it creates H2O. I don't want to get you confused about all that. So when we have a myosin head bind to the actin molecule, it also has ADP attached, adenosine diphosphate. So when adenosine diphosphate is there, it actually needs to recreate ATP in order to cock the myosin head at a certain angle to where it can bind actin. If we do not change this ADP to ATP, then the myosin head kind of stays limp, okay? We have to we have to take that ATP that let's like Cassandra says we get from glucose and attach it onto the myosin head and then all of a sudden it cocks it up and it's kind of like think of it like a like a like a loaded gun right like you're loading it up in a chamber you're ready to you know or a cannon maybe a cannon's a better example we're loading up the cannon to shoot the cannon you know we're loading up the myosin head so it's ready to bind the actin um, filament so. When it comes time to release and to relax, you know, we've pumped calcium out. Now we need to uh, allow the myosin head to, to release actin. We also need to take that ATP and move it back down to ADP, and then it releases from the actin molecule. Does anybody know rigor mortis? 
have we all ever seen, I'm sure we have some point in our lives where we've seen uh, the unfortunate event of a dead carcass. Yeah. Okay. Do we know what it is? Sometimes we may see some roadkill or a dead carcass on the side of the road and it's, and it's stiff, right? Um, does anybody know what that is? That's called rigor mortis. Yeah, it can. It can. So let me make a connection here. No, it's it's rigor. I'm gonna type it in. It's it's a it's a um, it's a Latin term. So I just typed it in. Yeah, exactly. So there's as Cassandra says, there's no oxygen. So I'll I'll try to connect the dots here, Stephanie, because it's all has to do stiffness is muscles, right? So yeah, Emily kind of Emily kind of makes that point. Eventually, the body will use up all the ATP in the body. Okay, the dead body will go through all the ATP, and then it'll all kind of degrade back down to ADP. If you remember what I told you about metabolism, it requires oxygen to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If, if an organism is no longer breathing, we no longer have oxygen as the, as the last ex electron uh, acceptor, which we cannot make ATP, which means that the muscles that are, that are still intact have myosin heads that have ADP still on their heads, which means they are still binding to the actin, okay? And then, I mean, just think about it. If we have no ATP, those myosin heads cannot unbind from the muscle, and then that's why you see stiff muscles, you know, legs pointing straight up or, you know, whatever else of, of, of basically a, a dead carcass or a dead organism. Uh, you know, some most of the time through roadkill or through, through something else. It probably takes about two to three days uh, to reach rigor mortis uh, because the body uses up all the oxygen that was left over. And once that's gone, uh, the myosin uh, heads with the attached adenosine diphosphate are still bound to the actin, which causes the muscle to remain in a contracted state. And that's why you see rigor mortis, uh, probably postpartum or not postpartum, postmortem, two to three days. So that's always I thought that was so cool when I was a student. I thought that was so awesome uh, because it actually applies things to to real life. You know, it can it connects the whole the whole dots, in my opinion. Um, so what makes the body relax afterwards really is the, the, the changing from adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate. Okay, we have to put ATP back on that myosin head, and that's what kind of makes it become uncocked. Um, if you were, if you were um, uh, if, I'm not sure if you just joined or not, Emily, but we just went over this. Um, when when we have the calcium when ATP binds to the myosin head, it it changes it back up to let's say a 90 degree angle, and it, it re releases it from the actin. And once it releases it from the actin, then it can uh, relax. It can be in a more relaxed state. Um, I think it's just oh okay excuse me. Um, I think it's muscle breakdown. Eventually, things are going to break down. You know, they're going to degrade, um, and I think that happens very quick. Now, you're okay. That's fine. Um, I think it's just deterioration. Eventually, uh, I think sometimes if the muscle is so far contracted, then it could, you know, it could tear at the ligament. It could tear from a tendon, you know, anywhere really. I think it's just degradation at that point. So. Things can dry out, you know, fairly, fairly, especially if it's more on the surface or, you know, in, in the weather. Um, okay. Do we have any questions about that?
So what that means, Cassandra, what we're doing there is that kind of goes back to enzymes. Um, if you remember enzymes, enzymes are proteins that carry out a reaction, right? And the funny thing about enzymes are is that they like to operate in a very finite temperature range. So if you ever think about, when you think about Brownian motion, you know, chapter two stuff, atoms, molecules, you know, let's say if we heat up some water, you know, things tend to move around a lot faster. Well, if we were to cool down the temperature, you may find things that move a little bit more slower, okay? Um, this applies to everything. Things tend to move a lot slower when we cool things down. Well, when we were to freeze something or put something in a refrigerator, you know, like we, this is like bacteria too. Um, this is how we slow the growth of bacteria on, on meats and other things if we put things in the freezer or if we freeze things, okay? If we freeze things, then um, it, things happen a lot slower. Um, the purpose is, is that these, it slows the enzymes down from degrading or, or if we're pretty much almost stops it. I mean, I don't know if you can completely stop it, but I think you can pretty, pretty damn close to, to halting everything, if you, especially if you take oxygen out of picture. Um, you know, if, you're, if anybody's ever seen a mummy, that's what mummies look like, you know, with, without any oxygen in them, in the, the body at least. So cold temps does a lot. Um, it also will slow the enzymes down or, or slow the whole degradation process down uh, because they don't like cold temperatures, so to speak. Um, people who have open heart surgery, I'm not sure if they use, if they do this now, but they definitely used to cool the blood down, um, considerably run it through a machine and, and it kind of causes the heart to slowly beat so they could do surgery, you know, open heart surgery. If they didn't want, if they couldn't stop the heart itself, but they had to do perform surgery, what they could do is, is slow the heart down using temperature, um, and cool in the body is, is, you know, to a certain degree. So it'll slow the, the heartbeat down and allow the surgeons to do what they need to do um, besides stopping the heart. They still do that for others for certain things, but I can't remember what it is. Most of the time they'll put you on bypass. They'll stop your heart. Um, they may do that. They may stop your heart by putting it, making it very cold kind of like hyperthermic state and then they'll they'll put you on a bypass machine and then they'll warm you back up shock you and then i think that restarts the heart um that i think that's 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 i think something like that i don't know the details of it um do we have any other questions So why does water seem to do the same thing because it is usually cold or because water can cause bloat? Um, help me, help me out, Alex. I'm not sure if I'm following you there. Um, what is it? What is it? What, what same thing does it do? I'm sorry. I guess that's the part I'm confused. You talking like a body, like a bloated body. Okay, so you're like you're saying like like a drowning issue, like a, like somebody drowned and you know and now they're all distended. So sometimes it's not water, sometimes it's actually gas, because it, because what happens is is that the lungs, if you like, if if if, it's, if, it's, if you're talking like forensically, um, from what I understand, if somebody were to drown, obviously they're going to inhale a bunch of water into their lungs. But then, you know, there's cavities and there's compartments, mainly the thoracic compartment that you probably learned about in laboratory one. And then you have your abdominal compartment, you know, split by your diaphragm. And then you have your intestines that can then have like air in them. There could be, there's areas where, where gas can um, accumulate, right? Now, unless you have like a stab wound or something like that, or like a through and through gunshot or something like this gas 
can, you know, distend your body and bloat, maybe that's what you're getting at. And that will, that'll be enough to rise you from, you know, maybe the depths to the surface. It just depends if you're, if you have clothes on or things weighing you down, maybe not. Uh, water can do to muscles long term. I don't know of anything that water can do to muscles long term. Um, unless you're talking like, unless you're talking like what a hot tub or something, or are you talking like, like water in the actual muscle? Um, like water retention. Oh, I don't think it does anything. Water retention can be mostly hard on your kidneys sometimes or hard on your cardiac. Um, it just depends where the water's at. Um, you know, if it's like high blood pressure and you had country ham, like I had, like I had country ham tonight. Country ham has a lot of salt in it. Well, let's say you eat five or six days of country ham and all of a sudden you got all this sodium on board. Well, if you know anything about sodium, the one thing that likes to follow sodium around is water. So all of a sudden now you're retaining all this water. Let's say you go to McDonald's where you eat fast food every day. You go to like Sodium Central and you probably have to get on Lasix just so your kidneys can filter out the so the enough sodium to where now your water retention in your body will 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 become a lot lower, right? And you know, kind of get you as they call it bone dry. You know, you're going to be bone dry. Uh, heart failure patients have this where you have fluid that gets built up in the lungs or gets built up in the lower ankles. Um, that's kind of a combination of the, the cardiac system that's failing and the kidneys that are failing probably because they've suffered through 30, 20 years of high blood pressure and you've pretty much just smoked all your kidneys. Um, I think that may be what you're getting at. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, uh, dialysis. Either I mean, we're going to touch on that. You'll definitely get into dialysis in bio one thirty nine. Yeah, you'll either have peritoneal dialysis or you'll have the real deal, which is renal uh, dialysis. So maybe that's what you're asking. Uh, but I can't think of water doing any damage to any muscles. Um, if anything, water just kind of helps flush out the waste. Um, like kind of going back to what. Madison said with lactic acid, the reason why we get lactic acid, if you remember anything in learning about glycolysis, you may learn that, yes, you can make ATP through glycolysis, but you can also produce a byproduct of lactic acid, okay? And if you know... You know when you have lactic acid build up in your muscles is because one, like let's say you haven't gotten on a treadmill and you just go get on a treadmill and you are a bit stiff and your butt muscles ache. You know, you have a little bit of lactic acid build up in your muscles. Now, eventually your muscles will get rid of this. What this is essentially is that your muscles have had to convert over to glycolysis because you're out of shape right your ass decided to go do some exercise thinking that you're in shape and you're really not and so what happens is your muscles were overworking they at some point they had a transient uh point where they had a little to no oxygen being delivered to their muscles right <clears throat> so if you remember glycolysis basically is what happens when you have no oxygen when you have no oxygen, your muscles will convert over to glycolysis to make ATP and produce lactic acid as a byproduct. You know you have lactic acid buildup when you're stiff, when you're stiff and your muscles hurt, right? That's kind of what happens. It takes a day or two for you to kind of get back to normal and climb those stairs or get back on the treadmill or stair stepper or whatever is because your muscles and you know you'll get better at it with time but your your muscles take a little bit longer to clear the lactic acid and uh that's basically just 
a point where there's been no oxygen delivered to your muscles and um, you produce that. So if you know you're in shape when you don't, when you're obviously when your muscles aren't stiff and you don't, you don't feel like an ache and pain because you're, you know, you produce lactic acid. So I hope that makes sense. I know I wanted to touch on that by the end of the night because that's also kind of cool. When you go like lift weights, it's a, it's a very good example. So, um, do we have any other questions, guys? Pretty good talk tonight. Thank you all for being um, uh, participating. I, I do appreciate that. It helps these things fly by. Anything else we want to discuss tonight? All right. Going once, going twice. All right. Yeah, you're welcome, Stephanie. You're welcome, Brandy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will catch you guys later on, and uh, good luck if you're taking exam three. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Hey, you're welcome, Alexa. Thank you, guys. Go ahead, Emily. Lay it on me. I can. I can, Cassandra, if you want. I can upload this one. Sure. Let it let it load up to the system, and then I'll download it. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Moomswa, Mas Masuma. Maybe, I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Oh, if it's my class, yeah, we had to cut it to two days. That's, that's, we, we got to, if you're, if you're one of my students, yes, we have to, we have to get going. Um, the, the week thing, I think there was some feedback that I've received from some of my teaching colleagues, how we had some cheating stuff going on and, and we can't be doing that. So I, uh, I had to change it to two, two, two to three days to kind of get some, get, we need to get going on it. Um, and there's been some other things, issues that I learned about exam one that some folks should have not done. So if that's, if that's why, yes. Um, yes, definitely do Tuesday. It'll be like that for the rest of the semester. Just because I, I tried to slow the class down as much as I could to get folks acclimated, but now we got we to gotta hit the next level and get going. Okay. All right, guys. Um, let me know if you have any other questions. Yes. Uh, I teach two classes, 137 and 139 and 225. Um, so yes, uh, uh, assume what, maybe that's, maybe that's how you pronounce your name. I hope I'm not botching it too bad. I apologize if I do. Uh, but yes, I do teach online. All right, guys, if the rest of you all want to cut out, cut out. Don't let me hold you. I'll catch you next time. I'm making sure if there's any other questions I need to ask, answer. Okay. All right, I think everybody's uh, almost out of here. You all have a good night.